Good evening. I'll call our regular meeting for the Planning Commission for Tuesday, June 11th of order. I'll thank SCTV again for taping this so that residents of town can hear what's going on. And let's see. We have seats on the Here. Sure. Seats you. That gives us six. So we're good to go. And uh, discussion of possible action. Uh, Hiram, uh, do we, uh, item number three, will run that like a normal public hearing? Is uh, that the actually a public hearing, uh, Mike? Is it just a referral? So okay. the applicant would, would make their presentation and okay. ask any questions you want and happy to comment as well. So. Okay. Great. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to recuse myself from item A of the agenda. Item three. Eight. About three three eight. Eight. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's about it. Good evening. Chip Houlihan on behalf of the applicant, Mark Beckham. going to be on this side. <laughs> the, uh, this is a matter that's been before the other land use commissions, uh, but not planning before. It is a continuation of a 15-month odyssey. The object has been to obtain a freestanding sign in front of uh, 10 Mall Way. Uh, the sign itself was approved last year by the, or the shape of the sign was approved by uh, design review, but it was, did not pass on it because it is an SC3 uh, zone designation, which does not permit freestanding signs. You must have an SC1. And that is the reason for our application to change the zone. It, uh, it may seem like an extreme measure, but it is something that's necessitated by the details of the uh, regulating plan for the Simsbury Town Center. And it's put us in a, uh, a situation that has required a great deal of, of effort, review, analysis of, of the regulating plan to figure out what was the best, most appropriate uh, way to proceed and the most effective way, uh, succinct way, the only way to address just this particular property, just this street, is a zone change. It is the vintage piece of property. It is listed in the uh, regulating plan as one of the buildings to be protected, since it was formerly a stable <coughs> of long standing. It is an area that is surrounded by asphalt on three sides. There was no nightlife there whatsoever before the Redstone Pub with their building there. It is, it, it was simply a dark road separating uh, Fitzgerald's Plaza from the rest of the, the downtown area. With the Redstone Pub, it tends to expand the entertainment district in Simsbury, the nightlife activity in Simsbury, and it brings life to a, a building that had once prospered, and then uh, most of its tenants disappeared, retired, and the building was underused. It may still be, and it's still underused to some extent today. The configuration of the building is that it is removed, it is not right on the street, and therefore the freestanding sign is necessary to obtain visibility. So you can see with the businesses there so the people can mark it in their mind when they travel during the day and think of it uh, at night. It is uh, a matter that the owner, uh, Mr. Lebeckin, thinks is necessary to promote uh, the brand, to secure it as a, as a continuing entertainment venue and to expand business in an area that had not had any business for some time. They, uh, there have been meetings ad nauseum about this with Mr. Lebeckin, uh, various town officials. We had, there was a meeting in the first selectman's office, uh, which included town council, where we had discussions on this in, in uh, February, uh, February, 13. And the different alternatives were reviewed. Uh, 
about what, how can someone apply for a freestanding sign. One issue that had been raised at that time was a text amendment. The difficulty with a text amendment is that it requires uh, changing it to something, the language in the regulating plan that would affect the whole town. We were just before the uh, design review, <clears throat> and they said, well, you know, I think there are only two buildings to be protected in the town. But if you look at the regulating plan, there's a designation for buildings to be protected, and there are over 40 black items there, which would require then for a sign to be able to show what the signage potential would be in these various locations in order to get the text amendment. The simplicity of the zone change is simply we are talking about mall way only, we are talking about this lot only, and we're not trying to redesign all the town, which is an awful burden to place on someone who simply wants to advertise their business. The, uh, the design review uh, chose not to recommend it. They thought it was a, um, they thought it was a, a drastic measure and, and uh, they didn't want to take it with the code. They also suggested that the sign might be unnecessary, that perhaps social media should be the, the uh, forum for advertising. I tend to think that that's not the, uh, you know, the burden. It seems to go beyond when you're asking for a sign and say, well, you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, they can do it just by uh, electronic means. Everybody, I guess, is on Facebook. The Redstone Pub is on Facebook. But having the physical presence in this area is of significance to us. Uh, one idea was, well, you know, there's a sign up there. It's behind a tree. So, well, there's only one tree in front of this building. They said, cut it down. Well, that is what you really want to do, and it's not that effective a sign because it's, it's far back. What we've done is to take a dark spot in downtown, add life to it at night, uh, and take it out of the doldrums and add something to add to the vibrancy of downtown. The, when we went to uh, design review last year, they said, well, we're sympathetic. And the sign meets things, but we can't deal with you because there's a zone, even because of the zone change. And that's why we followed this through. We met with the first selectman, talked to the town attorney. The zone amendment seemed to be the thing to do. Uh, Hiram had asked uh, Code Studio to take a look at this. And yesterday they came in with their uh, response, assuming you, you've received. And they said, you know, we're not unsympathetic to the idea of a freestanding sign. And they say, allowing a freestanding sign to support tenants in these key buildings, key buildings, may make good sense for the town. So what we're asking for is nothing that is, uh, you know, causes any apoplexy in the people that authored the code. What they do say is, we really don't think you should change the sign, the zone. And if you're going to change the zone, you need to have another vision session and look at what you're going to do, because you open, essentially open it all up again. We can't open up a vision session every time somebody wants to add a zone or add a sign. It is an enormous encumbrance on the ability to run a business effectively. At the design review meeting, Emil said, well, we went through this visionary process, and you got to look at what this is going to look like in 40 years. And if we change this now, it may change across the street. And so the 40-year vision, you know, is impacted. And my response then, my response now is, you don't get to that 40-year vision if the businesses can't support it. If you don't have life there, you're not getting, you're not going to get to that for you. This is an area that could have been developed at any time. In 20 years that I've lived in town and beyond that. And nobody ever built anything with a CVS parking lot and the Canada Park parking lot is 
It's just asphalt. And it had been a dead area at night. Now we're starting to see some signs of economic vibrancy there. And you have to nurture that in order to get to the vision, to attract the people to come and make the investment that is seen in the 40-year vision. But if you can't have a successful business today, your vision to the future is, going to, is bound to fail. You have to start with what you have and make it work. that you get into is when you look at the other, you change, how do you deal with the zones and design the zones? You know, Wilcox Street and Station Street have the same zone that we have, the SC3. But those have businesses that are right on the, uh, right on the sidewalk, right in the street. And they have a series of retail businesses going along. You don't want to have freestanding signs in the middle of that sidewalk. It's an entirely different circumstance, entirely different uh, situation than you do on Mall Way, where you really have only one business there, uh, where you have a sea of asphalt all around you, and you want that to develop and become a vibrant area. I've gone through the plan of development, and I have a series of uh, policy considerations that I'd ask the board, the commission, to consider in supporting and giving a favorable referral to the zoning board on this. Uh, you know, starting on page 69 of the plan, you say that the challenge is to promote economic development in the center while preserving the look and feel that <coughs> residents find to be charming. This is a business that has transformed a dark area at night into a lit, active, social, vibrant area. It brought uh, occasional uh, festivals like it did last weekend, uh, on the weekend, making, uh, you know, enhancing recreation opportunities for, for people in town, tying into the Calhoun race so the people that were here got to stay and enjoy music and entertainment. It's taking something that was dead space and is transforming it into something that the plane envisions and wants. The, uh, for design considerations, ask where, uh, we asked whether uh, the landscaping signs and lighting support a uniform architectural theme and are compatible with their surroundings. This is an isolated piece of property. There's no compatibility to be uh, tied in. And you know, the design review board last summer said that the, uh, uh, the design uh, satisfied the guidelines for community to design. So that what we're ultimately trying to achieve is what is requested. And the policy four wants to talk about a more pedestrian friendly environment. You do that by creating connector spaces. And this is as much a connection as you can get between the Fitzgerald Plaza and the Wilcox and Station Street areas. Uh, it's expanding the nighttime entertainment district. Uh, desirable performance objectives. It says we should rely on design review to guide design in the center zone rather than a one-size-fits-all standard. Yet when we were with, when we were before design review, they said, now that uh, the zoning is stuck the way it is, and we can't recommend a change. We have, as a town, boxed ourselves in and denied ourselves the flexibility to adjust circumstances because of the design review, because of the code that has been adopted. We knew when that code was being adopted that it was uh, quite regulating in all of its details. And the saving beauty of it is that it had the alternative compliance section. 
so that if there was a problem for any particular piece of property, that you could go to alternative compliance and you could show how that fit the general theme, area, and, and intentions of the, uh, of the town center code. Unfortunately, in our instance, alternative uh, compliance does not apply to signage. And so that's a route that's unavailable to us. Uh, the economic policies, economic development policies, one and six speak pretty much to this. Uh, objective B, ensure periodic review of economic opportunities and market conditions so that Simsbury can adapt to a changing economic conditions in the marketplace. This is what we have. We have a retailer in town in an isolated area that wants to be visible to attract business. That is a circumstance that we should be able to adapt to. And unfortunately, we have to go to the extent of a zone, of a, uh, zone change in order to get that opportunity. Um, in policy six, want to amend the zoning regulations in a manner that will responsibly foster a dynamic, prosperous business climate. The economic development implementation, implementation talks about diversifying the tax base, encouraging economic development to harmonize with the natural surroundings adjoining uses. That's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get this area. There isn't anything to harmonize. And if you go there at night, everything else is closed down. Uh, this is a beacon of business and development that we should encourage rather than discourage. And the, the code has put us in difficult straits. And the planning commission is an opportunity to set in for to report back to the zoning commission that there can be difficulties with the implementation and there needs to be flexibility to achieve this. Uh, and one of the objectives, the goals of economic development or to amend the zoning regulations in a manner that will responsibly foster a dynamic and prosperous business climate. And that's what we're attempting to do. So our sign isn't a problem per se. Design review said it meets our criteria, but it's in the wrong zone. The authors, Code Studio says, Please, don't tamper with all the detail that we went through to put this together. But the sign itself is okay, and maybe you can do something else. Maybe you can come up with a text amendment, which is an issue that really hadn't been explored before. And so the reason we're here for, zone, for support and zone change is because that was the most efficient, available opportunity for us to try and change one lot one street and not undertake the burden of redesigning signage for the entire downtown area. And so we would ask your support. Mark, is there anything you want to add? No, we're doing great. Tom will tell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's some other people in the audience, were you here to speak on this? Okay. Good point. Okay. You did not have that right. I, I have a question. Um, may I ask a question yeah, to Chip sure. or Mark? Uh, do you have a proposed location for the sign? Yes. Uh, it is, um, you go into the U of the, uh, of the barn. Ah. Let's help if we yeah, maybe see it here. Sure. Hiram oh. has a. Wow. Is the existing sign illegal? Is that enough? Uh, no. Is that grandfathered in the future? Non conforming grandfathered in the future. Is that the way it would be put in Yeah, there's, there's, there's one on Dave Richmond's building. But then this, what this shows you is you. Just, you see where room 10 is. And this area, the building, as you see, is, is back far enough 
so that it uh, it is further back from the road than Dave Richmond's bill. And I point that out because one suggestion is well, why don't you just hang a sign on the side instead of going for a freestanding sign. The difficulty, and Mark can speak to it more, is that you're too far removed from the road. Because of the distance that you're back, it's hidden if it's up against it. He wants the sign out, uh, closer to the road, so it has some visibility. The, uh, the tree that hides the current sign is over on the right side of the building. You know, it's the only tree on the mailbox. <laughs> on, on the the it's uh, right, that's a little shorter right, right there. Oh, okay. It's on the right side of the entry into the parking yard? Yes, and it has, it, it's hiding the old sign that says uh, uh, the courtyard, which would come down uh, to preserve space to put up the new sign. The sign would be uh, on the left side as you go in, the non-tree side. Mark, do you have? And if that sign was attached to the building, it would be legal. The only uh, difference is Well, there, there are two differences. One is you can attach a sign. Uh, problem is, uh, from Mark's perspective, is that it's removed back from the road. Oh, but it's a Richmond's building. The second aspect, <laughs> the second aspect is your standalone sign can be 16 square feet. Uh, your attached can be 10 square feet. Now, Amel said, you know, there's really not much difference in the size. But I said, but it's 60% larger to have a freestanding sign. And you have the more visibility as it's out there. Mark, you want to? Would you like to come down here and then I can show everyone the pictures I've got? So if you're standing up at Hop Meadow currently, this is Dave Richmond's sign. He has two of them, by the way, one on Hop Meadow and one here. And the proposal is, this bush is not here. We cleaned up all of this and made it pretty. Is there's the brick wall there? Is to set that sign right where this patch is, where the brush is, so that you can see it from the road. Because if you hang it on the building, you can't even see the building because this sign's in the way. In front of this sign is the emergency uh, fire um, landing from this Dave Richmond second floor. So if it's hanging on the building, you can't see it until you're right on top of it. So you'll notice that here it says the courtyard building behind that tree in the wintertime. You can't even see it in the wintertime, let alone in the summer when it's full of leaf. It's the only tree right now, and it's beautiful, doorboard flowering. We don't want to cut it down. It's also a historic building, 1904. We don't want to change the building by driving things into it and, and making it ugly. Um, so the idea is to put the sign literally right here, where it's visible from the road. And it would have 10 mall way, and it would have each of the tenants' uh, signs on it, um, so that it would be visible. The, the Richmond sign is not unlike the Joe Pizza Frog Saki Mura sign that Bruce has in front of Joe Pizza. Yes. And there's no, and that is, I assume, assume the maximum size allowed, Richmond sign? Yes. I mean, is there any, has there been any talk about, because obviously you're good for the neighborhood, about you putting your thing there, like Bruce Kaplan has the different, even though he owns all those, Kaplan owns all that real estate, this would be a different building, but in my mind, it's the same, you know what I mean, the same look. Yeah. It's, because it, Saki Mira is way in back, too, like you are. But they got visibility in front of Joe Pizza. And, uh, well, that just a thought. thought. There's a sign out at the road, at the Hot Meadow end, the beginning of Mall of the Way, that lists the, yeah. you know, the business properties right. in, in, the front of, in that courtyard or down that street in Mall yeah. This, is, this is the sign that currently exists, but as you'll notice, it's set back. It's not on the corner because of the state right away. And if you're coming from the north side, Yes. All these other cars and signs and trees blocks the view. Now we've already gone and trimmed the trees. I don't know if you noticed I, I paid to do that. And it looks really nice now. But it's also too far from any electric to light the sign. Um, so we've already looked at that. So this sign is basically not there for most people. And the number one comment I get from new customers, not existing customers, new customers is, 
I couldn't find you, so I kept going and I ended up having dinner at the Frog or the Maple Tree or, or Plan B because they were easy to find. I don't want to be unfound by new customers. So that's, that's the situation. It's like Abbey Road there. I'd expect to see a beetle walking <laughs> One of the uh, uh, one of the aspects of that, that sign that's on Dave Richmond's property, those properties used to be under single ownership. Mallway used to be a private street, and so the the sign out closest to ten is grandfathered in for. But what we're talking about is a sign on the lot, and in the. Uh, uh, signage regulations in the center zone. When they talk about the uh, number uh, for C1, they say one free one freestanding sign is allowed on any lot. I mean that's kind of a given, uh, and that's what we'd like to have in this situation. So, is it a is a zone change a drastic thing to do? You yeah, know, it, it it may look like the uh, uh, the most drastic step to take, but I suggest that it's the most limited, focused approach we could take because it only focuses on this lot and this street, and it uh, it doesn't put the burden on the applicant of looking at the other buildings that are designated as protected buildings in the center zone and trying to figure out how the signage would reflect with that. It, it would take the rewrite, I think. Uh, you know, there's a suggestion in the uh, uh, from Code Studio about how a text amendment could read, uh, but it would still take a much broader analysis and the zone change in this area that's isolated, otherwise neglected, covered in asphalt, and not having, you know, any other vibrancy on the street. It's the most targeted approach to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Iris. I'll preface my comments by saying that with all due respect to Chip and great respect for Chip and working with him over the years, uh, disagree significantly with many of the, the points of the, of the presentation. I'd just like to go, if I could, just take a few minutes and go through them. Uh, I think that. Um, I suspect that at some point in time the discussion of the, of the zone, the original intent of the zone, and how it's crafted would come up. And so I did ask Code Studio for their comments, and it's important that you take a minute or two and look at, at what they had, had said about that. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Lee said that they're in opposition to the rezoning. And it's important to know why he said that. I think the request impacts both sides of the street, both sides of the street, not just one property. It's both sides of the street. And because of the way the form-based code works, it's a street plan-based code. And so if the zone is changed for one particular street, it affects the properties on both sides of the street. That could affect the Cannon Building. It could affect the, uh, the property behind that. That is the parking lot that Chip referred to before as well. Uh, the impact of reducing intensity and requiring green space, pitch roofs also will be affected by this change. Changing the rules that apply to the street simply to accommodate a new sign defies logic. Um, this from the firm that, that drafted the code. There are other ways, but rather than this fairly drastic method of changing the zone to accomplish um, what the applicant would like to do. I'd like to talk about some of those alternatives in just a second. The strength of the existing regulation is that it um, relates directly to the desired form as illustrated in the master plan that was adopted unanimously by the Zoning Commission. The changes in the regulating plan, that is the actual zoning map, that is this front page that's on, that's on the code, uh, don't make sense without holding another vision session to establish an alternate vision. And I would agree with Chip that that's, a, that's an ex extensive and expansive and, uh, and a lengthy process. But that's the reason, in fact, that Lee talks about being opposed to the zone change. It's not necessary to go through all that. He talks about they're not unsympathetic to the design, desire for a freestanding sign for buildings to be protected. And that's a really key part of Lee's memo. 
there really are not a lot of buildings that are indicated to be keeper buildings to be protected. For example, in the SC3 zone, there are probably only three buildings in town that would have to be looked at. Uh, the courtyard building is certainly one of them. There are a couple on Station Street, and that's really all the buildings that are currently protected buildings in those zones. A small zone change, a small text change that referred specifically and only to buildings to be protected that would allow a freestanding sign is a possibility. That's one alternative. That would allow the applicant to have a freestanding sign in front of their building that met the size requirements, not the size of the one that you have in your folder because that's twice the size of the sign that is allowed in any freestanding sign uh, zone right now. That, that's 16 square feet only, the size of the sign that you have. And it's not a sign application, just keep in mind it's a zone change application. It's 32 square feet based upon those dimensions or something along those lines. So there's several alternatives that Lee talks about. Number one, he talks about possibly supporting a text amendment to the code that would expand the allowable frontages for freestanding signs to, to accommodate buildings to be protected. Again, that would affect only very few buildings. And they could be located in an SC2 or SC3 zone. So it would have advantages to other people that wanted freestanding signs as well. Uh, any freestanding sign in these zones should be required to meet the rest of the regulations that are in the code, in the SC1 uh, and SC2 and SC3 code. It is, he also noted finally that uh, the, the 10 square foot projecting sign is already allowed for each tenant space. And that could supplement the freestanding sign that might be allowed. So while I know that the applicant has said that you can't see a sign that's attached to the building, that's a projecting sign that's attached to the building, it was never the intent that you'd be able to look down the entire length of the street and see the sign of a building attached to that building and be able to identify it from Hot Meadow Street. They already have a sign in the corner right, that indicates where the pub is, where some of the other businesses are, and has an arrow to it. Uh, if that sign is not necessary and it doesn't serve the, protect the, the, the purpose, then that could be removed. But that's not the proposal. The proposal is to leave that and add another freestanding sign. So at this point in time, what's going to happen is that the Zoning Commission will have several different options. One is to agree to no change whatsoever. And I think everyone's sympathetic to the fact that businesses need to succeed. But doing no change whatsoever would leave the situation as it currently is. Which does mean that the applicant has every opportunity to come in with an application for an attached sign, a nicely designed, historically designed, projecting sign from the side of the building. As you turn down Mall Way, it's easy to see there are relatively few uh, buildings on the street where the projecting sign is nicely designed and externally lit could uh, identify the businesses in that building. The second thing that could happen is, as Lee Einsweiler had said in his recommendation, is that a small specific uh, sign for keeping keeper buildings that would apply to only two or three other buildings in the center of town, that, that text change that is for buildings to be protected could allow for freestanding signs. Um, that might be another possibility too. So that's one other thing that, that, that could be done. So there are alternatives to this zone change, which in my opinion, um, is, is a, a fairly drastic change to the, to the code itself. That, that change has significant uh, implications for a number of other areas in the center of town. It has implications for any of the other zones that are not SC1s. It has implications for other portions of Mall Way. It has implications for Station Street, for Great Hill, for portions of Railroad Street, Phelps Lane, and several other of the new streets which are currently alleys driveways or private roads, as Mallway originally was. So there are significant implications for changing the zone. There would not be significant major implications for using another method, either attaching the sign, nicely designed sign to the existing building, or to, um, or to changing that, that small amount of text in the code. So there are alternatives that could be employed, and it's staff's opinion that that is the way that, that this application should go. That's going to be our recommendation. Um, unless someone has a better idea in the meantime, we think that that's something that was brought up by, by Lee just a day or so ago, and we think that's a great idea. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Any other questions? Hi, Ron. Yeah, hi, Ron. 
procedurally, uh, the application that's been referred to us is pretty specific for the zone change. Can we offer alternatives? I think you need to make a, a, a recommendation on the referral for the application as proposed, Phil, and then say, however, we recommend whatever you want. You can say whatever you like, but I think that you could make a, a recommendation specifically to the application that's been proposed, and then go on to further say, however, we recommend the applicant explore the following. If that's, if that's what you choose to do. So do that. I, I want to understand the text amendment. This was a, an alternative that has not been explored? Correct. But Chip, you mentioned something of the, uh, I'll call it a variance or some other. There, there. We had this meeting in the first selectman's office. Hiram, Tom Cook, Mary Glassman, Bobby D. Presenzo was on the phone, and we talked about how to get from here to there. A variance requires a, uh, a showing of prejudice that uh, you know is is difficult to materially demonstrate. Uh, the text amendment was discussed, and, and Hiram says it applies to a few buildings here and there, and that's what, uh, and that's what Abel said earlier today. But uh, Code Studio talks about, uh, you know, this text amendment, and they talk about a building to be protected on the regulating plan. And on the very first page, there is this map that they have. And a building to be protected are all the black solid spaces that are there. So, you know, perhaps Plan B and, and, and Ten Mile Way and some others are, are what is in mind. But when I take a look at this regulating plan, it tells me that there are 40 of these uh, uh, buildings there. Now, not all of them are. SC1, which is a, a hot meadow uh, street designation, but uh, it would, to take that on, you essentially have to rewrite the zoning regulation for the downtown, and you have to have some semblance of how that would impact all these various things. You know, a because that's the language and the definition of building need to be protected are all those dark spots. It is, and how do you go about showing the impact throughout the downtown section for all of these different properties? It's, it's, it, it's a burden. And you're saying that if you want a freestanding sign, you got to redesign everything that we went through charrettes and all sorts of things for. Uh, you know, there's a tension for the center zone, uh, and it always has been. On the one hand, you'd like to promote a vision. On the other hand, you want some flexibility. And that tension was debated for years trying to come up with this. We haven't had much experience with it, and now this is where the tension, this is where the rubber meets the road. Where uh, Lee Einspiller, as a freestanding sign would be fine. It doesn't offend <coughs> the vision. But if you want to change the zone code, well, then we've got this vision. But he's not opposed to it. The sign review is not necessarily opposed to it. But they don't want to tinker with the mechanism that we have. But we're here now. We're trying to do business now. And we don't have, I don't think, a lot of targeted ways to change just this. And coming out of that meeting, you know, the, uh, uh, the recommended alternative in that meeting was the zone change, and so we pursued that. Um, and it just made the most sense, and it didn't have us redesign signage for the whole town, or downtown. Thank you. Maybe I'm talking on I mean, I'm sympathetic to Mark's situation. Obviously, if he had some ID on Route 10, and then then they see the second sign at the corner, that's that's great. And, and maybe it's out of place for me to say this, but have you? And maybe it's none of my business, but have you explored the possibility of working on Route 10 and maybe guess up the sign and get added there, uh, paying 10 bucks a month or something, as a as a way to have 
I guess we, when Hiram talked, obviously if it applies to the other side of the street and the other side of, of Mall Way, we don't want it to look like Granby Center. You know, I mean, uh, at 50 million signs, you know, that are there. And I'm just trying to figure a way that you can have your cake and eat it too, and your business can continue to prosper without doing, you know, changing all the rules and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm just throwing it out. I don't know if that has any <coughs> bearing on, you know, we, we or if it's any of my business. <laughs> I, I talked to Dave, and he has no problem with it. Problem is, no additional sign offsite is illegal He's according right. to the code. The code, the, says I, the code says I can't have an offsite sign in addition. So it would be against code to put up a sign on Dave Richmond's sign as it is. Dave has no problem with it. He and I have already talked to you. So it has to, is the ownership is what dictates it, Harold? It's, 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 off, it's an off-premise off -premise sign. They already have an off-premise sign at the corner. And the last time they applied, they were given permission to rehabilitate that sign repaint it or whatever to make it look better and better, more readable. That has not happened. Yet. It's like Iron Frog has the one in front of Joe Pizza, and then they have one that sticks out over the door that comes up this way. Now, is that a different zone? It's on the same property, and so it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's the own, it's, it's the real estate. It's allowed to have one freestanding sign, which it has, in front of it. And then it's allowed to have a projecting sign or an attached sign, which is an attached projecting sign. Same thing could be done here. Projecting so we could do the Richmond thing if we took the one on the corner off. Well, that's a pre-existing non-conforming sign. So I don't, I wouldn't think, frankly, if it were my business, I wouldn't want to lose that sign. I'd want to upgrade it, you know, rehabilitate it, yeah. paint it, whatever, make it more noticeable. You're talking about the one out on the corner? Yeah, yeah. The corner of Route 10. And, 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 and all that, yeah. And, you know, the, the problem is you want to have that identification of place in space and you know and that there, there's some genuflection toward that thought you know in the in the towns that are signed regulation because we talk about sign for a lot and the uh, you know you're talking about a situation of a, an isolated area uh, there isn't a, at night there's nothing else around there uh, it needs to attract attention to itself, and, and you know, you know while well, it'll make the point that you know, in 40 years it's going to look much different. You got to take the businesses today and, and have them move toward that vision. And, and until this happened, there wasn't anything at night. Um, that's why we're here. Other questions? Um, what are some of the other ramifications about changing the zone? Like we're just talking about the, the sign itself, but I'm sure there's other things that go along with that. Yeah, I think in Lee's memo it talks about uh, what the what the impact would be. Number one talks about uh, request impacts both sides of the street. So what we, what could happen? Certainly possible is that that whole section from the end of the Cannon Building all the way down to that intersection would be impacted as well. Uh, would impact signs obviously for the, for the current courtyard building, uh, the Richmond building is in SC1, so that's okay. It talks about uh, affecting intensity, required green spaces, the picture of the roofs on the opposite side of the hallway. For example, take a look at what the, the pitch of the roofs would be required. They're, they're different between SC3 and SC, SC1. So that if someone were to come in, and this is really not far-fetched at all, because we've actually seen sketches already, for buildings on Mall Way, further down Mall Way behind the Cannon Building, the look of that building would be significantly different if it were SC1 versus SC3. I think that's Lee's point in this number one here. And what he's saying is you don't you don't need to do that. You don't need to do all that upset of the regulation in order to get them exactly where they want to be. It's a really minor tweak to the regulation, and I, and I disagree with, with Chip in that. I don't think you really do need to do an analysis of every single building. Um, that analysis, for example, has not been done in this case. So if it's going to be necessary in that case, it should be done now as well. And I'm not suggesting that they need to do that. All I'm suggesting is that that, that text tweak would be a lot easier for everybody to swallow and that its implications and its impact later on would be far, far less. Um, it basically also 
talks about the changing, the concept of changing all the rules that apply in that street simply to accommodate the new sign. He, he felt were overkill. He, I mean, he says defies logic, but you know, just it, it's a bit overkill. So that's basically what he said. So that text tweet that you're, you're talking about, can that be made to apply only to the, the building to be preserved only on Mall Way, or is it going to affect all 60 other properties? Like It's only going to affect pre-existing uh, buildings to be protected located in the SC2 or SC3 frontage. And there are really only about three or four of them that are going to make any difference at all. Uh, and, I, and I think I mentioned those before. Uh, if you look on uh, Station Street, there's the hardware store in the building just before that. Um, plan B, possibly, and that's really about it. There's really not any others that are going to be affected. The Historical Society is certainly not going to change. There are no other buildings along the SC2 or SC3 that are listed as protected that are going to be significantly affected. By the, uh, well, then, that we know of today. Well, the only protected buildings are the ones that are shown here now. Those are kind of historical buildings, existing yeah, historical you're, buildings. You're, you're, you're intimating that there will be no changes to those buildings. Or, but 10 years from now, someone may decide to try to do something. Sure. They, yeah. could, they could come in and, and, and propose to change those buildings. Those are just indicated as keeper buildings in that the level of scrutiny when people do propose changes should be higher than if they're just buildings that are not proposed to be kept. It's like historic, historic buildings. People could come in and propose to demolish those. And frankly, if they own them, they have the right to demolish them. Historically, we'd like to see the historic buildings stay, um, and we try to convince them to do that. So if there's some other uses uh, that they could be put to, one of the things that they spent a lot of time in when they did the town center design guidelines, for example, was to look at what potential changes could, could come to these keeper buildings. How, how, would, it, how would it be changed? And they talked about trying to minimize the impact. Uh, one of the buildings that they looked at was the, the, the music store building over on the corner here. And, and what could happen under our current code, how to minimize that. So the design guidelines took a hard look at those, those keeper buildings and, and what could happen to them. So I think that's a large, a large part of why it was suggested that there are less detrimental ways to do exactly what they want. So you're saying that with a text change, you could potentially limit the, the effect to two to three buildings in total and they could get what they wanted. That's correct. Chip, can you address that? Well, you know, it's it's an issue that is, you know, we've been pursuing this for 15 months. Uh, no proposals have been made as to how that would be done. Uh, Code Studio just came up with this thought yesterday. And, and I, I don't know how to reconcile, and, and you know, I, I find the town center code very difficult to read through and comprehend. Uh, the definition of a building to be, and maybe there are keeper buildings somewhere else to find, but just looking at this first page, it has lots of things that are out there. Um, we've been looking for 15 months to find the least difficult, most efficient way uh, to get to a sign that has received basic endorsement from everybody, but they keep telling us that the zone change. And so, uh, and you know, we've had meetings with staff and town attorney and trying to search for the best method. All I can tell you is after that meeting in February, the zone change came out as the best method. Um, and that's why we pursued it. It's expensive now. The town fees have gone up. It costs $700 to apply for a, a, you know, a zone amendment. But that's where we've been bumping into. And, and so the scope, <clears throat> the problem is the scope of a text amendment is something that is hard to contemplate for an applicant for a single sign ramifications of that and, and how it radiates through, uh, you know, the SC 2 and 3 zones is difficult to appreciate. If that was the answer, then we would have taken that less difficult path. Uh, 
but the conversations we had suggested that that was too difficult. It, you know, as Hiram presents it, if it affects two or three properties, it sounds like a much easier burden. All I'm saying is that that easier approach is a new one to our ears. Um, and it wasn't discussed at that meeting in February. In February, it was just brought up by no, it was, the it was, design group. It, we as talked. Far as the text, we did talk about the text amendment, and and the difficulty of once you start tinkering with this, if yeah. you're going to change the sign regulation, well, what whose signs are you changing, and and the burden of trying to figure out what all the implications are uh, seemed heavy. I mean, I'm. We had the same discussion that I'm relating today about the uncertainty of how many properties you're impacting with the text amendment. And that led to the discussion saying, well, some change makes no sense. And so that's, that's what we did. With this new information dated June 10th, and from what Harm said, does this seem, forgetting February, does this seem like a viable solution if the town and the powers of be agree that's the way to go. I mean, now, is this a lot easier than if, changing the zone? In other words, is it, is it reasonable? If, if it, I mean, it sounds reasonable, all we want is the sign. <laughs> and, and it's been, it's been an extended and expensive path to try and, and get to that point. Um, and so, all I want is a sign. It's a text amendment, and it's not that hard. Well, you know, then maybe maybe staff could design something. Nothing's been put together, and and you know, for Mark and I to sit down and try and figure out what properties it applies to, uh, when the definition of the buildings to be protected is is this extensive. You know, we're you're, you're at a loss as a private citizen coming in. And wanted to change it. just to put a sign in front of your support. Hiram, is the possibility of a variance not a possibility here? No, the uh, chip, chip use a different term, but actually in the variance uh, world, you need to prove that you have a hardship. Wouldn't this building be possibly considered as a hardship type of building because it's the only one that has, is in the shape that it has, and it's kind of like hidden within the building because of its U shape, I mean, versus all the other buildings have, you know, a um, a store frontage or a street frontage, and this one doesn't. Yeah, I, I think that my recommendation would be that the ZBA has a high bar um, with regard to variances, and some of you may know, but I, I think that they look at each situation individually. Mm -hmm. Right. No question about that, uh, but the hardship question is really the issue, um, and when you talk about hardship. It's, it's somebody's statement that, well, nobody can see us. Well, and somebody's going to drag up a newspaper article and says, well, we're doing great. Well, you know, somebody, right. you know, so don't, I would just say, don't go there when there's a lot easier way to fix it. Well, I'm exactly just where you seeing need. it as an alternative to yeah. kind of expedite this issue well, along because, you know, you're always going to come up against issues like this with a big plan like this to accommodate. Yeah. Um, needs. I think I think Lee's memo really is, is pretty concise, suggests a way to get there. Um, I certainly don't have any problem with it as staff. I think it's a pretty sort of a unique tweak to the regulation. How long of a process would it be, in your um, opinion, to um, create a text amendment, and who would it have to go through? Well, it, it would be the same process as his own. <coughs> but what, if, if it were mine, what I would do would be to withdraw this application submit this, basically, what's a two-line change to the text. Mm -hmm. um, use the same memo that they created here, submit that as part of the application. And, and then what boards would it have to go by to be approved? Well, plan, uh, Design Review wrote, said earlier this evening that they actually recommended that. Mm -hmm. So their, their recommendation is already on record. Okay. Don't show, know exactly where this board will go, but I certainly would be in a position to recommend to the Zoning Commission that that's a, a much simpler and less drastic way to address the issue than, than his own change. 
So I think that the path to doing something like that is far clearer than any other path that I can think of. And the process could take as little as, say, two months? 30 days, two months max. And is there any extreme expense involved in this tweaking of language? No, I think the applicant, if the applicant wanted to, uh, to pull the application and then reapply that money to the new application, that's something certainly the board selectman gets to make that decision. We don't in, in house, but uh, that's certainly something we could recommend if they were interested in doing that. It would certainly be, a, as I said, a, a less, less onerous way to go. In my One other question. The sign out on the corner. Yes. Is that conforming at this moment in time? No, it's pre existing, not conforming. And so, what kind of um, upgrades can be made to that sign? They could, they could uh, replace it in kind, you know, they could repaint it. Mm -hmm. if, I think it was mentioned that one of the posts. I don't know if it's rotten or not, but it needed to be repainted. So repainting the sign, same size, same location, is acceptable. Same size, but it doesn't have to be in the same configuration that it is. In well, other words, the Redstone Pub could be much more pronounced well, on the signage of that space that it, it, it presently takes up. I, right? I think that, I mean, that's something that's got to be worked out with the other tenants in the building. You, know, you start to step on other people's toes at that point. I understand. So, so that's something that needs to be worked out. Um, I, I would have no but knowledge. they can't increase the overall size the of overall that size needs to be the same, correct. And the location is um, dictated by the state. Because well, it's of out of the state right just out of the state right away, I but see. it is off premise at this first said before. So so that's a, a currently a non conforming sign. So it can remain in its current location, can remain in its current size, but can be, you know, spiffed up, rehabilitated. Mark? Yeah, that's a question. That that sign that's Richmond sign. Supposing there was like a law firm that's where the Redstone Pub is now, and then those parcels, they were one parcel then, and they back said they were sold off. Does that mean that the law firm would have to remove its sign from the front thing? The signs are there now, they're pre existing now. I'm just trying to think of. If law firm leaves and Redstone comes in, do they have the right for that space? You know what I mean? For that space, you can the way you want. Because the ultimate goal is to draw people off of Hot Meadow. People find us, yes. Correct. And so Legally. that's where, you, like all the signs that are out on Hot Meadow, they are directing for the, for the inner that's space the exactly there. And so do we have a visual problem too, right? Where we have trees that are blocking that visual right away, that sight line from coming from the north of Hot Meadow, because coming from the south, you're visible. What, what you're thinking through, mm -hmm. you're going through the same mental work I did 15 months ago. Right. Uh, we already have approval from Design Review to upgrade that sign to <coughs> a much larger redstone pub portion, mm -hmm. much smaller top pieces. Nobody really knows that it's a courtyard building anymore. It's right. just all wet. Um, and then fresh slots, slats. But I found that replacing that sign at the same time we add the other one financially more advantageous, so I was told it was only a three-month process. I didn't expect it to be 15, right. so I was going to wait and do both signs at once. I'm at a point now where I've already trimmed the trees, right. I've already talked to Dave Richmond. Dave Richmond's sign still blocks it coming from the north, mm -hmm. and if there's a minivan sitting there, it blocks it, mm -hmm. but it's a whole lot better than it was with the trees trimmed, and if we paint it white and, and clean it up, uh, it will definitely improve, but it still won't solve the problem of saying this building is 10 mile away and this is where the redstone pub is. Well, the I'm sign says it's down that way, but when you drive by the road it's like, uh, it looks like it's dark and... I'm looking for alternatives for you and I'm not, I know, not I suggesting that the, a sign right out in front of your building wouldn't enhance your, your, your problem here. I'm just thinking that, one, you want to draw people off of, of hot metal, which is a real key, and then have a sign as they see that one, have a sign that you could use off your building. We don't even have to go through this process. And Hiram, another question related to that. How far off the building can he hang this sign? Projecting sign can project out in the building. It has to be attached to the building. If it's attached to the building, but I mean, there are attachments and there are attachments. Well, <coughs> there, there are basically uh, 
couple of things that would, would go to that. One is the size of the sign, and mm -hmm. obviously how it how it's suspended from that. Well, bracket. an old English pub would have an old English pub type sign, and yeah. wouldn't be, you know. Um, it, as long as it doesn't make it look ridiculous, I think that design review was suggested earlier this evening that that would probably be a fine way to go. And it could be lit. Externally lit. No be yeah. I'm just trying to think out of the box here a little bit. Where, because you're you're accomplishing two goals at that point, because having a, a sign out in front of your property isn't drawing them off the street, which is really what you want to do is draw them off a hot meadow. Some and somebody could get a permit for that attached projecting sign, you know, within two days, not two months, or two years. Could do that with a moving arrow like this, one of Roman corners. Well, <laughs> just disconnect one side. It seems to me that there's a couple alternatives here. Okay. Other questions? Would someone like to make a motion? I, I, so before I make a motion, Harlan, your, your comfort level, if you had to, maybe this, I don't want to put you on the spot, but because I don't completely understand or, or not, I'm not as familiar with you, but obviously with all of I mean, I read Lee's thing a couple of times and, and what you said. So what you what are you comfortable with, or is that not a question that's fair to ask? Yeah, that's not really. You, you need to. If you tell me where you want to go, I can help you, but I don't. I don't want to say this is what you want to do. Hiram, what's the um, is that horseshoe building, the one that has to be saved, the old stables, which is where the redstone is yeah. involved? Is that considered a lot by itself, or is the building out in front? Which buildings are? considered under this zone change. Yeah, the uh, building up front, the Richmond building, is part of the SC1 zone now. What the SC1 zone does is it wraps that corner by about 50 feet. 50 so it's the building out in the front, that, that's and the then SC1. down all the way down to um, that back alleyway behind this, sec this, this uh, second piece parcel, of property. This second parcel is where the SG3 zone starts, just, just a little behind the Richmond parking lot. Where the SC3 starts. I remember if we're looking at the, the map that you gave yeah. us, it's basically. Right where the color changes? Yeah. Where, where the, uh, I believe. Right where the this, word this 2013 in the Google is at the property line kind of. Yeah, right where the, right where the term more way starts. Uh, if you look at this, this map here, for example. Right, right where the mall way starts, right there, right after the Richmond parking lot. There's a okay. picture of Bill on this parking lot here. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just detail? No. Right here's the detail. Yeah, this one. Yeah. This one. Right here's the detail. Yep. That's it. Exactly. So it wraps the corner by 50 or 60 feet. That's so the right SC1. At, that's correct. Right at the end of the of the Richmond building, that's when the zone changes right there. The back of the building. Yes. Right, but Richmond's property is. SC1. Correct. Right. And that's why that's SC1. Okay. Thank you. Got it, Mark? It's, it's from here down to um, the other side, this back side right here. It goes all the way down to. Uh, Actually, all the way down to Iron Horse. Yeah. Oh, the SC3. Right. Which includes those parking lots. Yeah. Which is the bigger issue down the road at the time. Town ever does anything with the state or those back parking lots, which is what Hiram was referring to earlier, which many have called the past unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more, one more question: How, if a a tent sign was on the closest to Hot Meadow end of the building? Where the redstone pub is sticking out, how, how many square feet could that be? Do we know that answer to that? 16? 10. 16 10. square feet? 10. 10. Hanging is 10 square feet. Okay. And Hiram, you're saying a text change is only going to take. Potentially, is only going to take as little as um, 30 to 60 days. Right. And then we don't have any special exemptions, special rules, complications as far as zoning change. 
and then that would allow him to move forward and to actually have a sign out in front. Right. So there are there there are that text, alternatives. That text change were made, and that text change existed in the regulation today. Uh, they actually, uh, under the regulations, they have the authority to approve that because it meets the regulations. And would it only have to go through our board? It actually, when have doesn't to, have to go to with the text change. It's administrative, right. so Hiram office can't approve that other than notifying us, correct? Right. So it doesn't have to go in front of any boards? No, All it has no, to do no, is no. go through administration? What, yeah, what happens is that administratively have the authority under the regulations to approve it, and then what the Zoning Commission gets it is what's called a consent agenda. They get three or four items listed on each of their agendas that have been approved administratively, and they give the final what's called the official approval to that based under Connecticut law. They, have, they actually give the final approval. But the difference is only a couple of days. Obviously, I might approve it. <coughs> Monday, it might go to the, to the zoning commission. Seems to be the, the course that I would take because it just doesn't affect his property. It affects all of these smaller properties that may come up against the, a situation very similar to this in the future. And now you're solving a potentially larger problem for this whole redevelopment of downtown and not just being specific to one case here. Now, although Lee doesn't say in his memo, I think it would be fair to say that if they had thought about this exact situation when they were creating the code, you know, you would two, have been two additional lines in the code could have taken care of this. Right. The no, there's no way you can, yeah. it, it's hard. Possibly, I understand all the possibilities that are going to come before us. Okay, gentlemen, still looking for a motion. And the only options we have are to um, a positive referral or a negative referral on this um, and some request. Potential suggestions. Or we can kind of suggest to the gentleman that we um, withdraw this application, which was suggested, and uh, um, go for the text change. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with this commission suggesting to an applicant that they withdraw their application. I think, and, and Hiram, please correct me, but we have a item in front of us, there's a referral, we should act on that positive or negative suggestions if, if so decided. Are there any negative ramifications for us, um, say, denying the request and then um, there's that issue of a text change. I mean, once again, it's all procedural, and I don't want to create more roadblocks in the future. No, I think what Mike's suggestion was that make whatever referral you, you choose to make is, for example, if the recommendation is for denial, however, you suggest the following, you know, so yeah, that text change would be a just more appropriate. Text the positive side of it. Correct. I think we want to be careful to get an applicant to take an action, we need to act on what's in front of us. Um, and then I, I think having the ability for this commission to, to make recommendations as a part of that up or down vote, I, I think it's, it's a, a very positive thing. And I'd have to think that uh, zoning would take that into serious consideration. So I'm still looking for a motion. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion uh, to provide a uh, positive referral to the application, uh, given the applicant's uh, diligence in uh, trying to achieve their goal. Is, I, I believe the zone change um, for that one for the lot, even though it may uh, impact the property across the street. Um, in my opinion, it won't, it won't be uh, negative overall. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second.
Hiram, procedurally, we cannot go forward with that motion, correct? Correct. We have a second. Okay. Um, is the process, sorry to keep going back to you, I don't do this right. Um, can we ask that someone wants to make another motion, or do we have to have that motion removed? I didn't think we did. No, we okay. didn't get a second, so. Did motion dies. Okay. Would someone else like to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. It says um, that we deny the request, but um, encourage the applicant to um, go for the text change, which can be done administratively. No, the, I don't think the text change can be done. It's a re, it's a request of our. Is policy. I mean, no, Bill's, Bill's correct. The, the text change is, is just is a zone change, just like anything else. The signed application subsequent to that would be administrative. In other words, once the text change gets made. Right. And how does the text change get made? It, it's a zone change. The zoning commission needs to agree to make it, change in their regulations. As you said before, you know, that, that could go forward, that process could go forward in 30 to 60 days. I see. And what is, once again, I uh, withdraw my, um, my motion, but I, I want to understand this then. How does that actually happen? Who has to make um, an application to, um, to make this text change? How would this text change happen? The applicant could take Lee's memo, for example, and there are a couple of lines that are recommended here. They could recommend that, that they could reapply it. And they would have to go through zoning first. Well, who would they go through? They would get a referral back to this commission, just like this one. Yeah. The zoning commission would make the decision. I think that the motions that were, you're moving the, the yeah. Mark with, Mark send a negative. Mark, Mark withdrew his motion. Yeah. I, I, I removed it. I think, see if I got it right. Because I want to get this, this text um, um, possibility understood as far as how, um, Difficult it would be to make it happen before I, um, you know, s uh, felt comfortable myself with denying potentially um, a motion that's already been made because I, I, I sympathize with the applicant as far as what they need and I want to try to get them there with the least impact at the time. And if the text change is not out of the ordinary and doesn't going to take another six months like it does, um, a lot of things take. Uh, um, when it comes through the boards and gets through the, the process. Let me, let me be really clear, you know, a, a, a process can be, can move along very quickly. You know, if, if, if the applicant's willing to sit down and, and, and follow the process, you can move along very quickly. Yes. The applicant could decide, well, maybe we're going to do this, maybe we're not, maybe they come back in one month, maybe they come back in six months. That's totally out of our control. I understand. But you have to get on each person's agenda, and having to go through boards myself, it's getting on the agenda, and then it's continued for another month, and continued for another month, and then it has to be referred to a, another board, um, and that can be an arduous process. Yeah. And I'm just trying to find out whose boards it has to go through for this to actually happen. Planning is up. Planning commission for referral. Zoning commission for decision. So come to us first, yeah. and then it will be referred over to um, zoning for their approval. The application gets made to zoning, and just like this one did, it gets referred to you. So you make a decision before zoning opens the hearing. Okay. Zoning opens the hearing and makes a decision. So and in theory, um, it could happen in two weeks. In, in less than two weeks. Well, it's got to be legal notice and advertised, so that's why I say the 30 so days. So a month. 30 days. Okay. You've got a notice. And no meetings in July. So what, well, what you're really... I would see us have a special meeting for this. The motion is yeah. to deny yeah. this application because it's suggest asking for a zoning change. Suggest a referral and suggest that the applicant withdraw this application and submit an amendment uh, as specified, a text amendment to accomplish the thing as specified in the 610 memo. That's the process. And, and I think I heard a motion. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's what I couldn't right. recommend. Am I saying that right? Because I want it to be positive, yeah. but I want to uh, give them the. I agree. And that's I don't want them to spend any more money. <laughs> I, so I, I agree. If I heard Simon earlier, that accomplishes that. The only thing you don't want to say is 
you're recommending that they withdraw. You're going to deny it, and you're going to make a recommendation that they follow through with a text change. Okay. So we're going to suggest. All right, but yeah. and that's what I was trying to do as well. Yeah. Just yeah. how to um, word it properly so that it didn't come into yeah. another problem. So wood smithing. Yes. Well, we, we want to get it right, which is great stuff for us. It's what we're all about. So, who would like to make a motion? So for, yeah. That was for a motion. I'll second. Mark will second it. Will second it. Discussion. Um, yeah, the, I have a little discussion. A um, couple things in here seem to be pretty variable. Um, Look, you took a little out of yep, sorry. sorry having, for, uh, it keeps falling out. <laughs> I, 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 I like I like the way that the discussion is, is gone, but there are two things in there that uh, I'm not able to uh, reconcile with myself. First of all, um, there is a possibility that another application fee may be required, okay? And that's $690, $700, whatever it is. Um, and also the, the time that's been discussed to uh, possibly enact the text amendments, um, you know, these gentlemen were told that their original application might take as, as short as three months, and now it's been 15 months. So if I understand the possibility of things going, going well, but uh, I think the applicant should be made aware that we're not committing to any, either the, you know, the refund of the original application or the time that it may take to uh, have the text amendments enacted. Sure, I would certainly recommend that myself. I can certainly do that, but you're actually right. And, and I would um, suggest a friendly amendment to our portion of the suggest suggestion after we take the vote that we uh, respectfully request the town to refund or refund the uh, existing uh, permit fees and reapply those to the new in the event the app okay. applicant decides to uh, and, uh, and edit, they'll, edit they'll get our minutes as well. Get the tone. But if we make it part of the motion, it's much more concise than somebody trying to <laughs> read our min my minutes, which will be pretty lengthy tonight. Um, and also that uh, uh, we're not committing to a timeline, but uh, uh, I will personally commit to trying to have a special meeting if necessary to, to move this along because we do not want it to be a dark section of town, <laughs> and we want to keep the lights on. Right. And we're very sensitive to that and other sections of town, and I think that's the business we're here yeah, I, I, I still, I still keep getting the sense that, you know, that, that I think it's a very reasonable request to have signage for a business, yeah. okay? Yeah. 15 months, and you know, how many times do people come in here and say, oh, Simsbury's not friendly to builders and developers and business people? Well, geez, 15 months to, to get a sign that everyone agrees should go there? I don't know. That doesn't I, seem right. I don't disagree with you, Bill. But again, frankly, but our, our zoning yep. application was made in May, and when we're acting this in June. Mm -hmm. So um, to the extent we're doing stuff, we're yep. doing the best we can. And, 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 and we are, and we, we yeah, you're work. right, we, we are an administrative body. We have to, uh, you know, Right. And what came to us was the zone change, yeah. not the sign. So yeah. we have to we have to react to the zone change only. Yeah. Good point here. So we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, I think we're pretty much in line with everything else. Any more discussion, gentlemen? Okay. Aye. Favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Um, Sorry, we couldn't give you more of a referral. But thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Appreciate it. And we will do everything humanly possible to get you guys in and out. I can see that. <laughs> we'll monitor it. Mark, did you let uh, Bob know? Uh, we have another referral from the uh, Board of Selection, which I'm assuming the people are waiting patiently for a good job not falling asleep. I know that was really stimulating conversation. Yeah. You want this back so you can patiently hit it again? Not at times. Sure. Huh? Not at times. Um, oh, it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll keep it first when you come back. And <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Hiram, can you walk us through this uh, sure. road right away way for Firetown Road? I believe to be a fairly simple, straightforward manner. <laughs> this is a request uh, the town engineer, actually, from the, from the Administrative Administrative Services, requested residual right of way in front of number eight, Firetown Road. Uh, there was some surplus land that was uh, actually declared surplus when the road was realigned. Uh, I believe you all have a copy of the map that was provided that shows the surplus road. Uh, Rich Sawitsky looked at this, couple, did a couple of calculations. Uh, on May 23rd, uh, Rich Sawitsky sent a letter to the Board of Selectmen indicating to that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Grella and Mr. John Salvatore, owners of property at 10 and 8 Firetown Road, have requested the release of the residual right of way in front of number 8 Firetown, and then reached it a, a calculation showing the land to be released. Uh, to house number eight as 0 0.059 acres. Land released on the opposite side of the road, released to the town as 0 0.016 acres. The net land to the Grella Salvatore parties is 0 0.043 acres. And he even had the uh, assessor do a, a tax calculation, which is relatively minor, uh, turns out to $4.87 a year or something like that. <coughs> so it's a recommendation from the town engineer and also from the uh, Board of Selectmen, is that um, they, they approve this pending the approval of the Planning Commission because this is an 824 referral uh, and an administrative request uh, to you to agree to that uh, release of that right away. So that would also be staff's recommendation. In case you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, I move to agree. Okay. Oh, Before we get there, okay. or, would you folks like to add anything? No. Okay. Right, can you show me on your map exactly these little pieces of property? Sure. This this area here that's, that's dark, this is getting released to uh, this property. This little strip on the opposite side of the road that's also shaded is getting released to the town. And so what happens is that the right-of-way ends up being quite regular mm -hmm. and that the irregularities caused by the realignment of the road are corrected. That's pretty, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. This whole shaded part? Correct. That's yeah. only 0.049 acres? Right. For the town attorney. No, that's 0 0.059 acres. According to the, uh, I'm sorry, time engineer. Yeah. How big is the lot for number fire, number eight fire town to begin with? You know, the, the uh, it's about a third of an acre. Or so. so it's 12,000, 13,000 square feet? No, it's, uh, it's uh, 19,680. Proposed area would then become 22,265. So just, just uh, shy of half an acre. Pretty straightforward. No right, right now, right now, it complicates the the homeowner's position, right? With that having this uh, it does. house this property would, right there. This would allow the setbacks to become more conforming. It would allow a uniform curvature of the road. Um, remove some questions about um, easements and, and access way to the house in the rear. So but the the road's not going to be changed again. No, no. This has already been done. This really fixing the work that happened five six years ago. Uh, Nine years. No. We never uh, worried just, about it because both properties were owned by the same family. Mm -hmm. Now that my parents are deceased, the house has to be sold. So now we need right. to this, worry this, to fix yeah. it. To Someone looking to buy this property may say, boy, I don't like uh, yes. right. this arrangement. There's a bump in front of my house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so number eight, that's, that's the house of Santa Market now, right? Or yes. Yes, the stone yeah. house. The old stone oh, house. Uh, the stone house. Okay, any more questions for Hiram? Where you were about to speak? I move that we approve. I second. Second. Discussion? Sounds all, good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for waiting. That's quite all right. Thank you. Discussion item.
bench. Uh, village district and retop? Yeah, it's just very quickly, the uh, the next meeting on the village district study uh, in the Weetog area will be at June, 9, June 19th in the program room the library. <coughs> We'd like the, the consultant will be back with the, some of the suggestions that they heard at the first uh, village district meeting uh, that we had an email. How the business people and residents in that area participated. We'd like as many people from the public to come and, and offer their comments about this area as well. There'll be map, maps that people can mark up, some suggestions about what the consultants come up with so far, whether those are good ideas or bad ideas. We'd like to hear as much positive or negative uh, comment from the public as possible with regard to the village district regulation. This ultimately will be, become uh, a zoning regulation that will go to the Zoning Commission for possible adoption. As part of that process, it will get referred to the Planning Commission. In this case, also probably be, because it's a design district, will get referred to the Design Review Board as well for their comments prior to the Zoning Commission Act. This needs to be finished up before, um, well, it, it was supposed to be finished up by the end of June. We'll probably go slightly into July just because of the time frame. But very, very shortly thereafter, it should be finished up. Probably bring it to the Zoning Commission for their adoption right after their August break, something like that. So that's where that one is. We hope to see as many people come, as many land use board commission members come to the June 19th meeting as possible. Um, if, that's, if that's something that you can make, we'd love to see you there. Party the 19th. June 19th. I think that's a, think that's a Thursday. Is that the library? Program room from the library. Program room in the library. I believe that's a Thursday, I think. 19th of June. Pretty sure it's not Friday. June? June 19th. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Not a Friday, though. Next Wednesday. Yeah, next one. The second um, study that we have ongoing right now is the uh, Townway Marketing Study. The initial meeting with the consultant, uh, Fairweather Consultant out of New York, was held up at the uh, Masonic Hall. A number of business people, residents showed up to talk about, about uh, the marketing, townwide marketing, and what's going on. Had a good discussion about that, um, but the consultant is also collecting more information from the businesses in terms of what's, what's good, what's hard, what, what makes their, their lives easy, what makes it difficult, and putting that information into a database. They have, uh, I think I mentioned to you before, uh, a website that's set up. It's called simsburystrategy.com. You get a chance to go look at that. That's updated constantly with information that the consultants are getting about businesses in town. We're in the process right now of providing additional contact information to the consultant. Um, last time we had a, a brief meeting with them, they, they remarked about the Herman Drive area, for example, that many people in town really don't know a lot about or don't walk there a lot about. But he commented, he said, you know, that's, that's really only 10 minutes from the airport. It's really quite close. People don't really realize it. They don't really know it. So there's a lot of potential, he feels, there for, for doing some, some things here as well. So it's kind of interesting to hear different perspectives from somebody who's not that, that familiar with town. And hopefully that this marketing study, this is phase one of a two-phase study, finish this up uh, pretty near the end of June again, maybe trickle into July, but should be finished up pretty quickly thereafter, and then get into phase two as soon as we can find some more money to do I, uh, when I was reading through that material, uh, I saw an interesting comment that was made by, I think, someone who attended one of the meetings. And it talked about a critical mass of 13% of the town's population to live in the, in, the, in the city center, essentially, or town center, to support uh, a, a rigorous or a vibrant retail economy. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? And I think the same person went on to say that 1% of Simsbury's population now lives in downtown. Mm, that's probably about right. 1%, we, we talked about that during the draft <coughs> process as well. I don't know if the 13% is necessarily a hard and fast number. I think what was pretty clear at that meeting, even though somebody may, certainly may have said that, I think what was pretty clear is that the increased density in all the village centers, town center, uh, Terraville, Wetog, is important for the vitality of those areas to try to make them even more walkable, more sustainable. I think that was really pretty clear. The exact densities, I'm not sure if we'll get that get to that in phase one, <coughs> but certainly as part of phase two when the implementation comes along, I think that'll begin to dovetail with the town center study that we did, the retail study that we're doing, and that'll begin to pull all this together. So I think that's that's a good, a really good point. Well, I think that's important as well. It's interesting actually when you listen to the. Uh, the folks that have participated in the uh, 
we talk to those district studies so far, um, some of them think everything's just fine the way it is. Others looked at the Route 10 quarter study that we did, and some of you spent a long time on that committee. We looked at them, we had the Village Green that was created in the, in the Weetog area, and there was a statue there. It was really, you know, kind of a lot of interesting ideas. And so the density in that whole area might become uh, significantly greater, so that actually there was some, some real character and some real substance there. Initially, some people were concerned that we were just going to sort of put a, put a big X mark on, say, the, the Mitchell Auto Dealerships, for example. And my response was, you know, it's not really that we're saying that they can't be there or shouldn't be there. The fact is that, just like Wagner right Ford, what happens that over time, if they go out of business, then ultimately what should go there? We want your thoughts and ideas about what should go there to make that area vibrant. Uh, one other thing that we had was a comment, for example, from the Simsbury Inn people. It said, look, they have a lot of people that go over to Riverview from the inn and go back and forth to the inn. And seeing people walk along Route 10 at 2 a.m. in their tux is going back to the Riverview and trying to find their way back to the inn. It's not. <laughs> so we're looking at better pedestrian uh, you know, correlation and walkways through that whole area, sidewalks, um, different ways to walk through the areas. Um, there's, there's a lot of potential there in that whole area for future development. It could be fairly dense. But I think that as long as people can have whatever option they want to, if they want to have a house on two or three or four acres somewhere outside of town, that's fine. But there's a cost that goes with that. Kind of interesting recently that, that the cost of not only fuel, but vehicle and insurance and so on is a tremendous cost. Whereas if people live downtown and were able to walk to work or need, only needed a car once a week to go somewhere, that significantly reduces their other costs. So we'll be looking at all those things as, as part of this whole study as well. The last one I have is the, um, the Hartford Land Use Study. The, uh, the top three consultants have been selected. Um, probably by the end of the week, I'll be able to, to mention publicly who those were. But right now, I've got to notify those people and, and, uh, and notify those that, that were not selected. The uh, interviews for the top three consultants probably be held on July 2nd. And probably the week right after the July 4th holiday, we'll probably uh, get the, that consultant under contract and move forward. We need to have that wrapped up by the end of September as well. And that's, as you may know, from the last year at an extremely aggressive time frame, trying to move this thing forward. Each of those teams had probably eight or ten different members and three or four different firms in each one of those teams. So there's a lot of people, a lot of moving parts that will be busy all summer long putting those together. So very exciting. We're glad that the Hartford is, is willing to participate in this process. We're looking forward to something coming out of this process that could be hopefully really exciting now. Is it, is that like 600,000 square feet? How big is it? 638,000. So, so what will happen with that building and uh, with different ideas, it's all really in flux. And we're very anxious to see not only what the Hartford would like, I mean, obviously they'd like to see some single user probably come in and, and take it over tomorrow. I think the chances of that they fully acknowledge and are realistic about that, but that's probably unrealistic. So there may be a whole series of small users that may be different different uh, ideas for the building, how it could be used, and different innovation strategies. There's also 40 acres of land directly north of that that are completely undeveloped. A lot of people would like to see that remain as farmland. Well, that's whether that's realistic economically or not is a question. So we've got a lot of questions to talk about. 172 acres are at play here. Probably one of the second you know, sort of most prominent parcels in that area of town. And uh, it would be really great to get, get sort of a, a really nice plan going forward. We hope that the Hartford will like it as well. They adopt it and um, can get a buyer interested in it, or buyers interested in it as a result of what we do. It's a great for everyone, I think. I know uh, sitting there, it's been very interesting to hear some of the overall thoughts from some of these folks. It's very intriguing. Uh, the building actually does lend itself to be in the event they want to set it up as, as separate buildings. Three of the four pieces could easily be standalone units for lack of silos, they call them, um, which would be interesting. So, more to follow. Thank you. Uh, Thank communication? You. I'm sorry. No, I don't have any very well credit. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, communication. Yes. Hiram, I just want to uh, place uh, a letter that I received. Um, Regarding I'm not action items, so I just want to put that in the records. Okay, sure. Thank you. And approval of the minutes. Um, why don't we start with the April 9th minutes?
discuss yet. Uh, question, administrative question for you, Ira. Um, I don't have Bob seated at this point. Do I need to seat him in order for him to vote on the minutes? Yeah, he, he was only recused himself for one for that other matter. Okay, so well, I hadn't seated him because we had six members. So should I seat him? How would I do this? I'd have to ask Gary to step down. Yes, sir. In order, to, in order to approve the minutes. Oh, yeah, that, that'd be fine. I would do that. Yeah, okay. Sure. Gary, if you can step down, okay. Yeah. That okay. way Bob can comment on the minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we can check to see if Mark was here or not. Yeah. I was. Okay. I recall the, I mean, I was here for all the discussions on the. Yeah, I haven't the the agenda, remember seeing I your name in here. That's, the oh, yeah. You, you mentioned on line 40. So, okay. first. Uh, Order of business would be to add Mark to the following members. <laughs> and I was here as well. Oh, okay. This is April 9th, right? Correct. Right. April 9th. Yeah. This is when we're doing all the Hill Crest ones and I. Oh, that's right. I was definitely part of those. Changes to page one. <coughs> Hearing no changes to page one, or page two. Hearing none, page three. Hearing none, the only change would be to add uh, uh, Mark Drake and Gary to. Uh, being in attendance. Uh, all in favor, or can I have a motion to approve the minutes for April 9th? So moved. Bill, and uh, a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Bob. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor of approving the minutes for April 9th? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, April 9th is done. On to May 28th. Minutes for May 28th. And let's see. Okay, I don't see Mark here, so Mark, if you could I was not. step down and I'll put Bob on. I'll step down. Thank you very much. Any changes to page one? Which minutes are you doing? May 28th. April 9th. April 9th. 28th. Mike, was that the meeting you were not at? I was not at That's this meeting. So, so actually, Tina ran the meeting. Tina ran the meeting. So. On the 28th. 28th, yeah. Mike wasn't here. I was not here. So you didn't ask I was here. Because Tina was here. I know. was here. You were here. Okay. Then <coughs> what I will do is I apologize. Um, Mark, why don't you stay seated and yeah. Bob, you can sit yes. for me. Okay. Still can act as secretary. Yes. Okay. Sure. Just checking. <laughs> okay. Any changes to page one once we've got that worked out? Yeah. Tina she was the chairman, acting uh -huh. chairman, the seated. 18. Line 18. Line 18. Oh. Okay. Okay. Line 18 changed to all back. Okay. Any other changes on page one? Bless you. Any changes to page two? Hearing none, any changes on page three? Okay, so we have one change on page one. Uh, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Bill and Mark seconded. 
Uh, motion we have second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. And Mr. Jones. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Check abstentions. Thank you very much, guys. Good discussion tonight. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.